Bye, Claire. Hi. Happy Friday. Same to you. I'm not TJ. I'm Kristen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I just logged into CJ. <laughs> which coach do you work with? I'm under Sarah. Oh, nice. Yeah, which is great. Nice. Are you hopping on or have any specific questions? I don't have any specific questions. No, sometimes it is fun to see what other people bring up because it seems like, you know, if one person is experiencing something, it's pretty likely that it's going to experience or impact others too, probably totally. myself included. And where do you live? I'm in Portland, Oregon. Oh, cool. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I live in Aspen, Colorado. Wow. Nice. So also the, the West. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because Portland's at sea level and the highest I've ever been is about 8,000 feet in the Lake Tahoe area. And I felt, and I had never run that high before. And yeah, yeah last summer, I really felt like I was kicked in the chest or something. Like it was just such a difference compared to all the rich oxygen down here. So okay. yeah, that definitely made me think in the future, uh, if I ever want to do a race somewhere like Colorado, definitely something to keep in mind. Yeah, it's definitely like interesting when people come out and they don't realize, like we realize we're lucky living in a higher elevation. Yeah. And Kylie will be on in a few. She was just finishing up a call. Cool. What have you got going on this summer? Any big races? Um, Nothing in terms of races for the summer. Are you familiar with Hood to Coast? Mm -mm. Um, it's the largest relay race in the world. Um, it's out here in Oregon, which is really cool. It's from Mount Hood, which is like our, our tallest mountain in the area, to, I guess, the beach, which is really cool. Um, it's a 12-person relay, 200 miles. And uh, I have run that for the past few years, and this year I'm going to volunteer instead. I volunteered last year as well. I love volunteering for races, but it's, uh, it's sometimes feels harder than the race itself. Because um, totally. yeah. I was crowd control. That was like my role last year. And, you know, when you got a bunch of sleep deprived, overheated runners, it's uh, it's intense, but worth it. Yeah. And I uh, feel like volunteering, okay. you're not always taking care of yourself. You're taking care of other people and then you kind of neglect yourself. Yeah. I learned that the hard way with not having much water on me in an exposed yeah. area. So I learned for this year. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a neat event for sure. If you're ever wanted to do relay it's it's a really cool one and they each team requires i think it's like two volunteers or they can't participate so oh, cool. i always make sure to to help my team when i can nice what about you anything big in the immediate future not really just doing like a couple little local races um nice. but yeah nothing and nothing big right now sometimes that's nice i'm kind of enjoying that for now <laughs> yeah for sure That looks like Sue is on. Hi, Sue. Hello. How's it going? Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> oh, no problem. I'm Kristen. I'm not, it comes Hi. up as TJ. I'm not TJ. Um, Kylie will be on in a few minutes. She's just finishing up a call. Um, who do you work with? Uh, Zoe. Oh, nice. Yeah, and where I've never attended one of these. I just happened to see it, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Let me just uh, check in here." <laughs> yeah. I feel like these are really good ones. I have like a couple of, uh, like athletes that I was hoping hop on with nutrition questions for Kylie. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, and where do you live? At Washington D.C. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely it's interested in hearing what people have to say about nutrition. Yeah, for sure. Kylie has like amazing, amazing advice and knows a ton in that area. And what have you got going on this summer? Any big races or goals? Yeah, well, I'm um, I'm training for Wasatch. Oh, nice. In September, so still a ways away. Um, just kind of, this is the first time I've ever worked with a coach, so this has been pretty cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. And when the race is in September, you said? Yeah, it's in September. Nice. And nice. I mean, I have a little half marathon tomorrow that I'm doing here in town, a trail okay. half which yeah counts as like a step back week because we'd been doing longer runs previously to that. But I think I'm finally allowed to maybe run faster than easy. Yeah. 
I think. <laughs> yeah, if it's a race for sure. Training for a hundred, that's okay. Yeah. Is it supposed to be hot there tomorrow? Um, not too bad. I mean, everything starts at like um six nineteen. It's um it's a it's a Juneteenth themed thing. So the thing starts okay. early. So yeah, it should it shouldn't be too bad. It'll be done yeah. by before it gets too hot. Is it have been really humid and hot back east? It, I mean, it doesn't seem that bad to me. I'm, it gets much worse. Like it's only been kind of 80s, maybe mid 80s. But I mean, it gets so much worse that I'm just like, this is fine. <laughs> you look like you're under a bunk bed. I am. So oh. <laughs> this was so Zoe was supposed to, supposed to host, but we like did like a quick switch. But um, I have two young children, and they are. Oh. Um, and they're home right now. And I was like, you guys can watch a movie and I'm sneaking up. My husband and I both work from home and uh -huh. I was like, they're downstairs. And then I was like, I'm sneaking up. And then my husband's like, I'm on a call. So I'm like, well, I'm going into like one of my daughter's rooms and she has bunk beds in here. And I'm like hiding underneath. I was like, girls, you just need to watch a movie for an hour. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's All right. and Breer, Breer, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Pronounce correct. yeah. And Andrew. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Maureen. Hey. And Andrew, you work with Kylie, right? That's right. Yep. And Kylie will be always hopping on in a few. And then Maureen, do you, who do you work with? Kylie. Oh, awesome. So if you guys have specific nutrition questions, I will wait for Kylie, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I can answer other questions. I'm Kristen. I know it comes up as TJ. It's just under the general account. So it comes up under TJ's name. Mm. Have any of you guys dealt with a crack in your cartilage, knee cartilage? I have actually. Yeah. Oh, um, I, okay. yeah, I actually have a, myself I do. Um, are you having like walking? No, it's, I just got my MRI back and I have a small crack in my cartilage. Like I can, just, I knew something was going on with my knee because in some of my longer runs, it was getting really sore, nothing that hurt. And I noticed some wobbliness in my knee. Uh -huh. And it's like, I had a race this weekend. But I was like, you know what? I need to know what's going on in that thing before I go race. Uh huh. And uh, I got that back and I'm like, well, <laughs> I should probably address that because my, yeah. Well, I mean, what are they like? Did you talk to your doctor yet or not yet? Um, yeah, I'm, I want to get a pro opinion, a professional's opinion Yeah. Um, before I do anything too crazy because I just went to my local doctor and ordered M an MRI from Inland okay. Industry, and they gave their response. Like they analyzed it. Sure. But they didn't give a recommended because they typically don't do a ton for that. Um, because anytime that they, and I'm not obviously not a doctor, this is from my own personal experience of like an ACL tear that I have a crack. And the only issue I've had, um, and I've had it happen one time in for over four years that I had all of a sudden locking again, but I have um, like hardware in there as well. So we weren't exactly sure, but they thought maybe a piece of cartilage had cracked, a, a piece of cartilage had cracked off and slid in and then caused locking, but then it slid out on its own. So I was able to like, but I was locked and then it unlocked on its own. But um, I don't know what they specifically do for like, did they tell you anything? Like, would they well, repair? My, no, my they... doctor here locally was just like, ice it, stay off of it, stop running. Um, don't put a lot of uh, impact on it. And then she recommended um, maybe going in and getting injections just to, they, I can't remember what the term of the, for the injection. Cortisone. They typically give people cortisone. That's like what they, they told me. If it got really bad, they could give me a cortisone injection, but there are definitely other concerns when you do get cortisone injections. So I never um, went that far. But yeah, I would definitely talk to a, um, like an orthopedic, um, who deals with that because they see that's a common thing with like any degradation of cartilage. Oh, gotcha. So what, yeah. what, what all do you do? Did you, cause I like, uh, I don't feel like it's very bad. I, I can 
you know, I can go out and run 20, 30. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I can look it up on, I'm sure I have like a great, what do they call it? Like they grade them. I think I have a grade three crack in, in the cartilage, but I also have like had an ACL meniscus repair. I had two broken, but like this all occurred around the same time. I had like an impact fall, oh, um, wow. like two broken bones, a ACL tear and then they were which they repaired but then I've had that crack and it's only like bothered me one time and they suspected it was that um but I haven't done anything I do a lot of PT relating to like um knee rehab still four years later I still do a lot um yeah. like at home but just a lot of strengthening um and I just I it doesn't bother me though so maybe that would be the best place to start because I, I do quite, quite a bit of strength training, uh, yeah. lower body stuff and just different things. Nothing super specific for knee stuff or knee rehab, but is yeah. more, or brings more of that. Yeah, I would definitely touch base with like an orthopedist um, and see what they recommend. I'll have to do that. I think Kylie's here. Let's see. Yep. Kylie's here. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, Andrew's uh, my athlete, so. I know. I'm like, well, I, I, I was like, if you guys have nutrition questions, hold off. But um, <laughs> I don't know. Have you had any of that? Anyone with a crack in cartilage? No. I mean, and it can also just be wear and tear too. It doesn't have to be a like a trauma. Yeah, like I can't. The only time I can think of, like, I haven't had any falls this year yet, except for when I was in Pennsylvania, I was running on the streets there and there was so much, I just wasn't paying attention. I was more focusing on dodging people. And, you know, there was some, you know, uh, some of the concrete was so far out of level and like um, heaving quite a bit. And I stubbed my toe several times, just pounded it. And like it, I was like, Ooh, man, I've, almost felt like it did something to my knee, but I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling anything. And I, I don't know if it's, that's when it happened, but I've never, yeah, it's, I don't know how, I wish, I don't know, like, if it's a grade one, grade two, grade three, like you were talking about. I would find out, yeah, they definitely grade them, like, I think it's one, two, three, four, um, and it's based on how big it is and how, like, far it goes down, Um and then I think that it also, like, I would definitely touch base with the doctor because I think that it depends on, I know with like any kind of knee things, depending on how old you are and kind of some of your background, they decide whether it's worth repairing or not. Because a lot of times they don't want to potentially repair and take away any more cartilage like than you have. Because sometimes when they go in, they have to clean things up and it they have to take away some. And um, so I would just touch base with the with an orthopedist for sure yeah do i don't know Kylie, what do you think oh yeah definitely i mean we need some orthopedic specialties looking at that for sure <laughs> versus <laughs> you know i i think it's nice to like read online or get end of one people experiences but with that kind of stuff i just more medical professional guidance yeah. i think would be good because everyone's different, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else, Maureen, Claire, Sue, Zena, Briere, have any questions? I have a Kylie question. Um, oh. you, you can ask me in the log too. This, but way. it's a com it's okay. a complicated question. And I've never been able to come because I've always been working or had a school. Oh, okay, event, cool. So, <clears throat> um, it might be relevant for other people. So the backstory is I'm hopefully planning to turn an ultra at the end of July. And I've actually, I normally don't use caffeinated gels and caffeinated hydration mix, despite consuming a lot of caffeine. I really like coffee, which Kylie knows. And I'm sure that would probably be helpful, but is it better to have consistent caffeine throughout or like spike it at like three hours, four hours, six hours? um that's my yeah. question okay and it would I figured it would be relevant for no everybody. that's good no it's good this actually would be helpful to a lot of people and I literally just had a discussion with a microcosm athlete at 8 a.m this morning about the same thing um um so I think 
honestly, you've got, there's a couple things to consider. Like, uh, are you somebody that would have a propensity to, for GI issues? In which case, then I would say not doing every hour would probably be a better strategy. Um, no matter what you're doing, I usually say to wait till at least like third to halfway through the race to start introducing. Okay. And then depending, you have to consider what kind of metabolizer you are of caffeine. Um, you may or may not know that, but uh, if you're not a quick metabolizer of caffeine, you do have to definitely be a little bit more cautious because, you know, for some people, like this is going to have an additive effect and it could really add up over time and then put you over the edge later on when it, and it's like too late, you know? Yeah. Um, and make you like really jittery and just like, uh, like not feeling great, nauseous, et cetera. Um, so that's a consideration. And then, um, if you're taking it, there's just different recommendations if you're taking it per hour or per every other hour. So the person I was working with earlier, they were like 80, um, 80 kilograms body weight. And so we base it on body weight and it's like, we would do one to two milligrams per kilogram per hour. If you're doing it every hour, Okay. Whereas like you could spike it more, like have three milligrams per kilogram per hour. If you're doing every other hour. Okay. Um, so this person, if they did it every hour, 80 to 160 milligrams per hour, or they could spike it and do a higher amount, like 240 or something um, every other hour. Um, okay. And then this other person, um, we were talking about like using it beforehand. So they were going to do a bigger hit, like three milligrams per kilogram pre-ex pre-race and then wait till a third to halfway through and then figure out whether they're going to do every hour or every other hour. So hopefully that helps. That but helps. You also want to do it in your, definitely do it in your training for sure. Yeah. Um, Even though like your training runs might not be super long, I'd still be like practicing with it maybe. Okay. That's helpful. I've used it like on and off in case, like in the event we've bought like caffeinated gels, but never in like a true race plan. So mm -hmm. yeah. And then the gum, like considering caffeinated gum, if you are somebody that has a propensity for like more GI risk, um, you could do the caffeinated gum instead. And that might, might bypass GI stuff a little bit. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's a good question. I did have a guy that did Leadville the one year and he like didn't tell me that he was doing caffeine in his plan. And I don't think he really practiced with it. And then he like started using a ton of caffeine in the middle of his race and totally his race got ruined because he we didn't talk about caffeine. So <laughs> yeah, I guess I've always used it like I've always been a chronic caffeine user and mm -hmm. I've just never incorporated it into a fueling plan. So yeah. I've like gone on a run post consuming like oh, upwards yeah. of a thousand milligrams of caffeine, but I've never like run for multiple hours dosing caffeine. Mm -hmm. Know your love, your caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> We've worked on that. <laughs> I drink le less coffee now. I know. <laughs> as I take a sip of my caffeinated coffee right now. <laughs> Can I ask sort of a follow-up? Um, yeah. That, so, you know, you were talking about, yeah, practicing it during your training runs, but obviously you're not going to have training runs anywhere near that long. And that sort of brings up my parallel question, which is like so far um, with Zoe, you know, we're just trying to concentrate on getting like two to 300 calories an hour, you know, basically sugar um, mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, certainly at some point, I'm sure we're going to introduce some more actual food, like for a hundred. But if like my training, longest training run is like a 50 K, like how do you train for something like this? And in my history with longer runs, I've always just eaten real food, sandwiches, you know, nuts and stuff. And I, I, I know she doesn't think that that's a great idea, but um I, I'm just, I mean, I'm sure she and I will talk about it, but since this was available, I thought I'd, you know, yeah. just sort of a, like, how do you figure out a general nutrition plan? Sorry, this is like a very basic question No, um, that's for, no, for a run a that is way longer than you're ever going to do in your training. And why can't I eat a peanut butter sandwich? 
Oh, you can eat a peanut butter sandwich, actually. Um, well, it, so here's the thing is you want to think about, you want to have a minimum of like, usually I say 40 grams of carbs an hour. So that's something to think about. So then the choices that you're making, 40 grams of carbs an hour is 160 calories. So if you are trying to get closer to, I would say if you're doing an ultra, 300 calories an hour, which should be your goal. Um, then you can make up that difference with a little bit of protein and fat as well. So there's nothing that says you can't do that. Um, and I actually would say like, you would want to practice with some of those whole food options, especially as you get further along in your training and whatnot. Um, I think the, the challenge always is like, you're never going to get that same experience as like, if you're doing a hundred mile or you're not running a hundred miles in your training runs. So anything can happen, but the goal is to get your plan dialed to, um, to a place where you feel as confident as you can. And then you have backup options planned in case something goes wrong. So for instance, like if you feel like you can't eat something, like you don't, you're tired of chewing or like you have palate fatigue, then like, okay, what, what are you going to do in that situation? And you have a liquid option available or you've got a savory option available like potatoes because you don't want anything sweet anymore. Um, so you know that there are options for you if something goes a certain direction, um, which, you know, you can plan as much as you want, practice as much as you want, but on race day, things are likely always going to go wrong. So it's like, how do you adapt? And what does that adaptation plan look like for you? Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind is like being prepared for things to go wrong in a hundred mile. <laughs> um, and then like, I would, like I said, I would start incorporating, maybe you do do some gels during your training session, but then yeah, yeah. like one of the hours, bring in your PBJ sandwich and see how you handle it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I want to just say in her defense, it wasn't, it was like the bags of nuts and like the solid chunks of cheese that she thought was just going to make me, you know, shit yeah. my pants, well, well, <laughs> which, which has not happened in the past. I mean, that's the thing. I've always just kind of just tried to eat yeah. real food. And I actually focused a lot on just because it was what I craved was like protein and fat. Maybe it's, I don't know. Well, it, it, it is like in longer events, like you can. Yeah. So the faster you're going, the more the blood is diverted away from your gut, which slows mm -hmm. down digestion. Protein so for somebody who's slow, maybe I can get away with more yeah, exactly. solid foods. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially That's that could be a thing to think about for you. But mm -hmm. to her point, like you still need to have a minimum of 40 grams of carbs an hour. So we bring that in with the nuts or with right. the okay. cheese, And then you can kind of make that, that, um, balance happen i think you know and just one last thing for now um <laughs> like, oh you're fine it, so like let's say you're whatever 30 hour 36 whatever however many hours is um do you recommend sort of starting out like changing the proportions as you go along you were, you said you know 40 grams an hour of carbs like would you start with more carbs and then introduce the kind of proteins and later on or like I'm not sure at what point your body is just like, I can't deal with this. Maybe it's better to get it in early. Um, well, so the reason why we're bringing in at least 40 grams of carbs an hour is because you end up depleting your glycogen stores or your stored carbohydrate. So at that point, your body has nothing else to use for carbohydrate, like energy, quick energy production, um, unless you break down your muscle and you use fat stores, et cetera, but that's a much more inefficient process. So you want to have exogenous, like out, outside sources of carbs coming in so that you can have, continue to have some quick energy production while still using fat and protein for energy production as well. Um, so the idea being that, um, like you could start out with more carbs per hour at the beginning. If you feel like um, you want to preserve glycogen stores longer, that's something to think about. And then like a couple of hours in, you start bringing in more of your cheese and your nuts and things like that. That is a strategy mm -hmm. that some people do. But some of my athletes are just like, 
you know, I'm going to keep a consistent whatever grams of carbs per hour. And keep in mind that 40 grams is like a low end, like you can do. Right. Cause you said that was 160. So if I'm going for 300, where am I going to get those other 140 from? Yeah. So you have to think about where you're getting that. Are you getting it from protein and fat or do you want to push your carb intake up a little bit too? Like mm -hmm. 60 grams of carbs an hour. And then the rest is coming from protein and fat. So is that's where the personalization comes in though. Like you can think mm -hmm. about that for yourself and what you want to do. And then like, think about laying it out on a, like a chart and Excel sheet or something like that. So you feel like it's like organized and you can practice it and hit your targets. Um, that's kind of, that's kind of where I think, uh, you know, it sounds like you're like starting the process out. Well, it's just then like refining it and bringing some, maybe bringing back in some of the things that you were consuming before and seeing what the good, the right balance for you is. I mean, do some people just do these whole things on just like the sugar? I mean, well, that's what the tailwind package says. Like just um, not <laughs> for hundred mile. I mean, sometimes like coach Zoe, like, yes, but she's also like kind of a little bit of a uh, digestive freak. Like she can do that. But most of my athletes are not doing their hundred milers on just gels and liquid carbohydrates. Um, okay. they, the nausea and the sweet fatigue yeah. sets in. Um, mm -hmm. So, so breaking that up with solid foods is actually something to think about. You know, that's why I okay. would really want you to bring some of that stuff back in. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyone have other questions that Kristen and I, and I don't know, Kristen, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> I mean, that sounded great. I defer to finally <laughs> on all things nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> Kylie, I actually, if no, I mean, uh, can I ask you a question? Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Okay, so this is a question that I wondered like a little bit for like myself and but also for like any endurance athlete. So obviously like we're burning tons of carbs and we're fueling with tons of sugar. And I really like, probably if you looked at my actual diet, you'd be like, oh my gosh, there's so much sugar in there. And a lot of it is during activity. Is there ever a concern that, and I know you need it for training, that there's too much sugar? Um. Well, I mean, I think that's a complex question because we do have like a certain amount of need for carbohydrate and, and it becomes a question of like, can you meet that with more complex carb sources or more complex carb sources have more fiber? So is that going to like yeah. be too filling for you and you can't even meet the carb needs? So I would say the priority is meeting the carb needs and then the focus on how much of that is going to be more complex uh, carbohydrates in general, like all carbohydrates break down into sugars, right? So like, I think you're referring to like simple carbohydrates, which are going to be more like quick acting, like raise your blood sugar quickly. Um, in which case, like if you have high volume of training, like you might need to have more simple carbs because your body is just like, I need this and I'm using it right away. Um, if you're not having as high a volume training, then maybe you switch that focus to having more complex carbs. So that's like something I do work with people on, you know, at different, um, points of the training cycle too. Like what, you know, could I, could I focus on different types of carbs because my training volume and intensity is different. And that's like more advanced, like focus on your nutrition, I would say. Um, but overall, the priority is total carbs and like, can I meet my total carbs? And then I can focus on, okay, how am I going to meet them? And, and then go from there. And then, you know, like I, I work with some athletes that do have elevated like A1C or A1C, like, yeah. yeah. So their blood sugar is like more in that like pre-diabetic range and they're concerned that like their consumption of carbs is like their simple carbs is the cause when traditionally, if we look closer at that, that's not actually the case. There's usually some other potential causes of like elevated A1C, maybe being um, stress related via training or life stress or combo um, or um, 
looking at if there's even an interconnected relationship with iron too, um, iron thyroid conditions. So there's like some other things that usually I'll explore with people if there is like a concern for elevated A1C um, versus like a it mainly being like a concern for too many simple carbs. Awesome. Yeah, no, I was just wondering as like people age, you know, they're always like, you know, and I guess it's probably a little old school of like, oh, you have too much sugar. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, I'll be done with my run by 8 a.m. And I'm like, uh, I ate like three gels on my run, you know, like, and then I'm like, and I don't limit other food during the day. Um, yeah. But I guess just like monitor your other levels. Is well, like yeah, but like also your carb needs, it depending on like, I know you do decent training volume, like, sometimes I don't think people recognize what their carb volume looks like on those days, then it's like yeah. 400, 500 grams of carbohydrates, which is a lot, you know, and, and in order for you to meet those needs, you have to be fueling carbs during your training session, or you're going to really struggle to get 500 grams of carbs in, yeah. in the day, you know? So I think that's a, like, that's the example of the practicality piece. Like you need that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Anyone else? So I'm on a phone, so I'm not quite sure where the buttons are. You're fine. So you can hear me fine. Cool. Yeah, you're fine. Um, Go ahead. Uh, my question is about how much fluid you can intake um, in an hour. Things have heated up where I live. Um, so I'm pretty much close to heat adapted, which basically means my sweat just pours out and my sweat rate at the moment is it's going to be, it's about 1.5 to 1.7 liters an hour. Mm -hmm. So it's, how do you get that in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you, and can you get that in? Because there's going to be a, an upper limit as to how much fluid you can get in per hour. Yeah. Yeah, no, there is, uh, there's a great book called the athlete's gut that's by Patrick Wilson um that he talks about this a little bit where we typically see like uh, about 1.2 ish liters per hour maybe a little bit more as being like the upper limit for most people for absorption rate um so the idea though being like you're trying to minimize losses keep that in mind like um, replenishment of a hundred percent every hour is not realistic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, for some people that have high fluid loss rates, like they're just going to, like the goal is to minimize as much as possible, um, to try to prevent over 2% losses of body weight from fluids. Um, and so that's the other thing you can do is look at what would 2% of losses of body weight from fluids be for me. And then how long would that take me depending on how much it's a lot of math, but if you want to do it, no. you, you know, that makes I, sense. I need to do it because I've got a hot yeah. hundred miler coming up. So I need, I need to know because I mean, the night's yeah. going to be fine, but during the day, because it's very, very steep, mm -hmm. um, your sweat rate is just going to, well, my sweat rate is just going to go through the roof because yeah. you're pushing it aerobically. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I would say, I would say like you could even do higher level calculations there and look at, you know, with how much I'm replacing every hour and then what is 2% losses of my body weight from fluids? Like how far, how long can I go until I get to that 2% loss rate based on like how yeah. much I'm planning on consuming? Um, again, that's higher level, but I have done that with like people that are really trying to be more precise with this. Um, and then I like your thought process of having a night versus day target, because a lot of people don't think about that. And that is there, it can be huge swings in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and, but yeah, like as far you can, you can train the gut too to handle more fluid absorption, but with there still seems to be that upper limit where it's yeah. like, you can't do much more. Even 1.2 liters an hour is a lot though, like carrying that and stuff too on your training runs. Oh, I know. It's like- I, to, usually I drink about 900 mils an hour. Okay. Um, I have 600 mil um, soft flasks are a game changer mm -hmm. for me because I carry one, two, and then one on my back in a oh, yeah, that's great. belt mm -hmm. all the time. Um, but yeah, 
and can you make up for the losses because I've got long climbs so I'm mm-hmm. just going to have to accept that you know if I've got an hour and a half climb at 20 percent I'm going to be depleted by the top mm-hmm. can you replenish on the downhill or is it worth trying to get ahead of it before you hit these big climbs um you could technically make up for it but for so going back to what we were talking about though like uh there's still going to be a limited capacity for absorption yeah. so you could though if you're like oh i only consumed 600 mils um and on the up then on the down i'm going to try to consume more than double that or something yeah. you know what i mean so you could do that for sure okay cool make sure you cool. got proper electrolyte matching the fluid intake though is the thing <laughs> yeah that that was actually my next question because um after my success of formulating a dried food that I can make into a paste in a flask. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it worked. it's worked really, really well. Um, I'm going to have a go at making um, an electrolyte drink. Cool. And you've got, yeah, um, this excites me. I'm an ex-biochemist, so I love the science. Oh, bit. that's awesome. So, um, I mean, there's different concentrations of um, sodium, potassium, mm-hmm magnesium and calcium in there and i'll decide which ones but some of the sports drinks just have sodium and potassium in is it worth putting the magnesium and the calcium in or is that just like an added bonus (laughs) well it kind of depends so like you have to think about how long the race is that you're doing because it's that's the idea is like um you're losing all of these electrolytes in your sweat in smaller amounts than the sodium. And it's like, will that catch up to you? Like, will the hole become so great that it might catch up to you later? That's a possibility with hundred milers for sure. Um, But also sometimes people are in their food or whatever are consuming some magnesium and some of these other electrolytes that it's not really going to have that big of an effect on them because they are getting it in through the other like calories that they're consuming so there doesn't be a direct focus on it so you could analyze your your fuel sources and see like what's the breakdown of the other calcium magnesium it's i mean you're deep getting detailed so you might as well do it so (laughs) so then you can see like what you're consuming and uh and um i will say so sodium's lost in the highest amount in sweat and then we've got pretty high magnesium loss like decently okay so that's kind of the next one um, that sometimes we can become more, more of a problem later in a, in a race. So, you know, thinking about that as like, okay, where, where would I get my magnesium from, um, mm-hmm. could be a, a thing. But again, if you're using whole food options or like food paste or whatever, like you might be getting magnesium in and it's like, eh, do I really need to focus on it much in my, in my drink mix? Yeah. I mean, I've decided not to put salt in the food mix because I want to keep salt separate to hydration. Oh, okay. I think yeah. that's going to work best, I think. Yeah. But hopefully this won't upset my stomach. Yeah. It's it's a it's an experiment game kind of, you know, uh, especially if you have a sensitive system, you know. Coach Zoe doesn't need a like she doesn't have a sensitive system. She can do a lot of things and she doesn't have to be that calculated about it. So I'm really insensitive. I'm really sensitive to fructose and a lot of other FODMAPs. Yeah. So I got to the point where there is no gel or real food option made for sport on the market that mm. doesn't flare it up. So oh, this I'm was sorry. like <laughs> this was a last ditch as in how am I gonna fuel this yeah. race and yeah, not how ha- what that's happens fine, at though, 100K. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had athletes make their own stuff. And especially the fact you have your background that you have, like you have a good understanding of what this need, like the precision that needs to be taken in making the product. So I think that you'll be, I feel good about you doing that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy. I'm down to it's 45 gram dry weight and it has to be dry because... I've yeah. got no crew, so it's stuff's going to sit in a drop back bag. So I'm down. So in the, if you like the gel, if you like, 203 calories, 31 grams of carb, four grams of protein, seven grams of fat, because I run better off a bit of protein and fat in there and That's not awesome. all carb. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm happy. Seems to be working well. <laughs> Yay. Cool. 
Congrats but, yeah. on figuring that out too. That's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually been really good fun because I started the baby rice, but the baby rice is too clumpy. So oh. I've now got a, so <laughs> I've got oat idea. flour in there to make it um to make it better. I mean, and there is some sugar in there too, but it's all stuff I can buy from a supermarket, That's except awesome. for the dehydrated fruit powder, which is just there as a hint of flavor. That's so, yeah. kind of cool. You should share your uh, you should share your like recipe on the microcosm thing. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, I can do. I mean, if you're if do. you're willing to, like, I think that's kind of cool to, but also like preface by saying like obviously you want to be pretty precise with how you're making this, but I'm doing this thing. I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited to try the um hydration out but I will not be using it at the race um I'll stick yeah. to the tailwinds because I know that works and okay. hopefully in the future I'll be able to switch nice yeah. amazing that's cool thank you yeah of course all right who's next anyone they don't have to all be nutrition questions either by the way because coach Kristen's here too and uh <laughs> anyone <laughs> I have a follow-up question uh based on that last conversation and that would be and the answer is probably it depends but I'm going to ask anyway okay is, great. uh does hydration needs for people who menstruate change during menstruation since I imagine there's a bit of extra fluid loss uh yeah potentially higher the it's hard to quantify is the thing it's like higher fluid and electrolyte needs both uh, pre, like in the couple of days beforehand and then during menstruation as well. But again, like that's always the hard part is like, how do we quantify this in a way that you're able to apply it to yourself? So maybe just like experimentation or, I mean, you could consider do doing fluid loss testing during menstruation to see if there are differences there. And then you might be able to get a better quantification for yourself too. Yeah, definitely. Because then if you have higher, so going back to the electrolyte piece too, if you've got higher fluid losses during menstruation, you're going to have higher electrolyte losses because the electrolytes follow the fluid loss. So then you could, you could actually, depending on how you know, detailed you want to get, if you get sweat testing done, sodium sweat testing, you could then apply your sodium sweat concentration to your fluid loss rate during menstruation and then get a, a different target during that window of time for yourself. So that could be, yeah, that, that would be a way to do it actually. Yeah. That's probably a good thing for me to do anyway, that kind of comparative thing. So I'm also on a diuretic that's potassium wasting. So I'm already oh, need to yeah. be sensitive about electrolytes. So yeah, that'd be a good thing for me to do. You should. You should totally do the the sweat testing for sure. Thank you. Um, what is the sweat testing and how do you know your sweat rate? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, the lot trying to <clears throat> kind of simplify here. Um, the sweat testing is something you can do um, at home, you can go through a company called Levelin. They do a patch that they send you in the mail. You um, put it on before. Lo Levelin? What? How do you spell it? Levelin. L e v e l e n. Levelin. Okay. Um, so you can do that, and uh, it's a one-time thing you do. Put a patch on, exercise, and then you go. You send it in, and they analyze it. Um, mm -hmm. You can also go to a precision hydration in-person testing center. Those are kind of located across the U.S. and internationally, too. Um, and then there are wearables that you can get, H-Drop technologies. You can get a rechargeable wearable that you can do. But um, I really find that the only benefit in my mind from that is... Uh, that you could look at real-time fluid losses um, and not have to use a scale all the time. So, um, you know, if you get real-time fluid losses, then that's going to give you the sodium losses. But really, mm -hmm. your your sodium sweat concentration of your of your sweat is not going to vary that much. It's pretty genetic and it stays pretty stable. 
slight things that might change are like as you become more heat adapted or um, fitter, you might reabsorb electrolytes a little bit back in through the skin into the body and be more efficient oh. at utilizing mm -hmm. them. But that is also hard to quantify for a person. So utilization of that is not necessary. Like that idea, it, you know, it's not that helpful. It's just more like understanding what your sodium sweat concentration is can really help you get into a better box of like, am I a super salty sweater? Am I medium? Am I really low? Um, so that you can kind of get yourself in a better spot for your fueling plan for your intake during exercise. So, and is this the salt or the, if you, people are talking about calcium, magnesium, and potassium too, like how mainly, specific does this get? Yeah. So mainly it's paying attention to sodium and, and uh, chloride on the test results. Um, yeah. but the other electrolytes, so as I kind of mentioned, like we don't have to be super concerned about them potentially later in an event. If you are somebody that cramps a lot or like a, a long event, like a hundred mile or something like that, we might want to look okay. at that. Um, but the sodium is the main thing because it's lost in such large amounts, comparatively mm -hmm. speaking to magnesium, potassium, and all those things, unless you have a con taking a medication where you are losing a lot of potassium or something like that, then you might have to be more conscious during exercise that you have to also focus on that electrolyte and taking that in. So sodium is the main one that you're going to want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, when, if you do so, uh, sodium sweat testing, you, you are going to formulate your fueling plan based on your fluid loss rate in combo with your sodium sweat, uh, concentration. So what the fluid loss rate is, is that's the amount of fluid you are losing every hour during exercise. And you can get a mm -hmm. general sense of what that is by weighing yourself on the scale at home. So you mm -hmm. can do that pre-exercise, post-exercise with no clothes on. And then mm -hmm. if you consume any fluids during exercise, you need to be sure that you include that in the, you know, calculations and everything. Um, but you'll standardize your results to how much did I then lose in an hour? So okay. say you lose uh, a pound or two pounds in an hour, you'll convert that to ounces, 16 ounces for every pound. And then you will make your targets based on those average losses every hour. So we'll use the example of a pound an hour. If you're losing a pound an hour, you will, you're going to target 75% replenishment of whatever you're losing every hour. So okay. 12, you're going to do about 12 ounces an hour, 12 to 15 ounces an hour. You don't want to replace a hundred percent of losses every hour because there can be you know, some variation there. So we don't want to do a hundred percent replenishment every hour. And then the sodium is going to match the fluid. So if you do 12 ounces of fluid consumption an hour, then you also need to match the sodium, like your sodium sweat concentration, say it's 25 milligrams per ounce. You'll take mm -hmm. 12 times 25 milligrams per ounce. That's the sodium you'll consume. So it's a lot of math okay. and, yeah. uh, you, like I'm sure coach, uh, you said Zoe is your coach. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure coach Zoe has done this herself and she can probably guide you if you're like, Oh, what do I do with this number? Can you remind me how to do this? Like mm -hmm. most of the coaches in microcosm can help with like general, you know, how to calculate that sort of thing. So, um, okay. yeah. So is there any harm in just popping those salt tabs every hour and just leaving it at that? Well, potentially. Yeah. So that's why having a handle on this, if you are doing, I recommend sodium sweat testing for anyone doing 50 milers, a hundred milers, because mm -hmm. your propensity for making a mistake, it becomes larger because you're out there for longer. So mm -hmm. if you, if you get yourself into a huge hole, or if you have an overconsumption every hour, that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm later in the race nausea vomiting diarrhea stuff like that is going to come up mm -hmm. if you are grossly off in your consumption so, so like let's say i live in washington dc where it's like hot and humid but this race 
is in Utah at like 9,000 feet, like there's going to be so many differences, like in super exposed. And I don't know how, I think it's probably fairly dry out there. Mm -hmm. Like how does, it, how does what you test in your home area even relate to like race well, day? Well, so uh, altitude increases fluid loss rates and electrolyte losses and so okay. does humidity. So I would oh, say so maybe it's the same. <laughs> probably be kind of similar, to be honest with you. Um, so okay. the situation where you might be able to apply. Now, if it's like a grossly different situation where it's cold somewhere and then you're going to be racing somewhere hot, that can be a little trickier to figure out. But that's also why I suggest that athletes get in the habit of regular fluid loss testing so that you get a sense of how much am I losing in cold temperatures or cooler temperatures? Mm -hmm. How much am I losing in hot temperatures? And that can really help you get a sense of like, I've had people have huge differences, like a pound an hour in the cold, four pounds an hour in the heat, you know? So it's like a really, really big difference there. And um, yeah. just knowing that can help you. It's never going to be a hundred percent precise. That's the reality. But like, again, mm -hmm. it's more like, can I get myself to a better in a better spot, in a better box, so I can have this more dialed. Right. Okay. So hopefully that's like a long-winded answer. Sorry. No, no, no. It's great. One thing specific to your race that doesn't happen where you are is like um in the West and in the mountains, we have really large temperature swings. Like, you know, if yeah. you're racing in September in the Wasatch, like you know, you might have 40 degrees difference on course. It could be 30 overnight and it could be 70 during the day. So just knowing mm -hmm. when you come up with your race fueling plan, like in your hydration plan, knowing when you want, might be losing more versus losing less, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's, um, you'll definitely have a big temperature swing in that race. That's such yeah. a good, yeah. Thanks for saying that. Cause that's, that's huge. That's kind of like what Zena was saying that like, at um she's gonna have different targets for fluids like at night versus day and that's something especially if you're racing in the desert those huge swings are gonna be prominent like javelina races too uh huge swings in temperature so um be prepared any other questions I have a non-related nutrition question. So this can be for anyone. I have, um, I've never used drop bags and I have a plan, but I wanted to see if this is a good plan. Um, so at each drop bag, I'm going to have another, between my partner and I, we have mul like enough vests to do multiple. I'm going to have a vest, which if things are going well, I'm just going to take the vest and it's going to be pre-packed. If things are not going well, I'm going to have like a Ziploc bag of like my alternate fuel source that I know works if my stomach has turned and like not an over, like I'm not going to pack for like a 12 hour camping trip in my second bag and then put those both in like a drawstring bag. Has anyone ever done that? And is that a good idea, a bad idea, or should I have a third idea? That's great. Okay. Yeah. Are you... Like when you get a drop bag, do you have a crew where you get your drop bag or no? Uh, no, it's just going to be, unfortunately, my partner is going to a conference and he ran this race and I wasn't there. So it's like part, like swapping. Um, and we have two different personalities when it comes to planning for things. So I asked him what he did and he told me he put snacks in a bag. And I said, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh they'll yeah they'll also be like a full aid station but I want like my plan your own stuff yeah I think that sounds like a good plan okay and you just have to hope that you grab the best but if not you have a backup you know okay yeah that was kind of my thing and I've will have worn all the other thing is I will have worn all three vests to make sure that I ideally like them the other thing is like I would check on the aid station stuff like People are like, seem scared to, if it, if stuff isn't published on the website, they're like, well, I don't know. It's going to be on the aid station. I'm like, just email the race director because it's good to know what is going to be at aid stations because That's... then you can grab stuff if you have, if you absolutely have to, you know? Yeah. And I do know, um, okay, and good. I'm like somewhat familiar and like also like the, like 
those are also all fine like tertiary options as well right. Anyone else? Any non-nutrition questions? I'm like, this is nutrition Q&A hour, <laughs> but that's fine. I'm used to doing this. <laughs> I'm, I always tell like everyone who I have, I'm like, you guys ask me questions. I'm like, ask Kylie too. I'm like, hop on. Yeah, that's funny. No, no other questions. I think I'll be again. I think I have another one in July. I'm in the coaches table july 12th so if anyone has nutrition questions <laughs> come on july mid-july i'll be able to call you mid-race then <laughs> oh perfect yeah do that call in be like we have a live call from xena <laughs> that'd be hilarious xena what race are you doing i'm doing a race called echon milak in the north of spain um you will have heard of zagama I will yeah. be doing the interesting parts of Zagama at kilometer 130 to 150. Oh, nice. Yeah, really nice. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> technical. Yeah, I'm the, um, went there last September just to do part of the route on holiday and you know the, the climb that you see with everybody lined I have no idea how Killian runs up it. I really don't. <laughs> and then the ridge, um, it was nice to see that some of the elites were looking like Bambi on ice because I was definitely three points of contact. <laughs> That's hilarious. But, <laughs> yeah. But the downhill after that, it's like 30% and it's gullied. So you can only get one foot in. <laughs> Wow. Um, I have no idea how I'm going to get it down at that kind of distance because it's got over 10,000 meters of up and down in total. So my quads are going to be completely trashed by that point. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be fun. It'll be, I'm really looking forward to it. I, it's a race I've wanted to do for a very, very long time, but it's not a first hundred miler. It's one that <gasps> I've had to work up to to have the confidence to be able to go forward and give it a go. That's awesome. How, how long is it? Like Pardon? Overall, how long it's is it? It's 171 kilometers. So it's just over a hundred miles um, and say 10,000 meters of climb. I don't know what that is in feet. I'm really sorry. Like 28. A lot. Like, yeah, a lot. A lot. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Those Euro races are crazy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, races are. Um, yeah. <laughs> if they came from a background of FKTs, how quick can I go around this mountain route? So we don't, in general, have flat races. <laughs> That's funny. And we don't room trails either. But that's another story. <laughs> Anyone else? Last comments? Anything? Thoughts? Cool. Uh, Whoa, I don't know what that was, but <laughs> someone's sound design. Oh, is sorry. I thought, yeah, that was me. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I'm you're fine. testing a bassoon read. I thought I had the mute on. That's hilarious. That. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I think we're probably good. And then uh, the next one will be in two weeks, uh, right before TJ's Western States race. So um, I think half the coaches will be at Western States. <laughs> so have everyone have Thanks, a guys. great weekend. And uh, yeah, ask Zena, share your recipe if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, ask your questions in the Slack channel too. Slack channels. And I put those in the chat here. I put the level in and precision sweat testing, just the links. Awesome. If anyone's looking for those. Awesome. Thank you guys. Bye guys. Bye.